Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, that's, folks. That's not on either. And then it is working? Oh, that one's working now. Okay, so maybe Checking. Just... I'm going to just uh, hand this off to Katrin. Here you go. Okay, so um, I don't think this is working either. Yes, it is. It is? You can hear me? Okay, yeah. great. So I think we should um, go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the seventh joint UW Microsoft Symposium. For those of you who are new to this event, this is something that takes place every quarter, either here at UW or over in Redmond on the Microsoft campus. And we usually either have um, two talks or a talk and demonstrations, and today it's going to be two talks. The first one is going to be given by Ken Church, and the second one by our own Jeremy Kahn. Oh, and I would like to acknowledge all the departments who, um, who are supporting this event. So that's linguistics, Germanics, computer science, and electrical engineering. And I'd also like to thank the Linguistics Students Graduate Organization for organizing this next today. So thanks very much, guys. And um, I'd like to introduce our uh, first speaker. Just me. Uh, are you doing the first one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So that's uh, Jeremy Kahn, who's a graduate student in linguistics and also physically working in electrical engineering in the SWI lab. And um, his talk um, is going to be um, joint work with Mary Ostendorf and Dustin Hillett and is entitled Spontaneous Speech, Challenges and Opportunities for Passing. So, go ahead. Trying not to destroy the mic line for either. We're being recorded by Microsoft as well, uh, so hi guys. Um, the talk, title of my talk today is uh, Spontaneous Speech and trying to deal with spontaneous speech and the issues and opportunities that arise when you're trying to uh, do parsing work on it. And I wanted to, of course, credit my, co my, my collaborators here, Mari and Dustin. Mari is my advisor and she is currently in Germany. Dustin is here in the audience somewhere, um, I hope. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. Now I can ask him questions if he gets stuck. Um, and there are uh, other collaborators from Brown University, Matt Lees, a graduate student, and Mark Johnson, Eugene Charniak. Uh, and thank you to the, again to the National Science Foundation for funding some of this work. Um, so one of the questions we might ask is, why are we interested in parsing com uh, spontaneous speech? In general, why are we interested in parsing? Well, we might be interested in parsing for understanding, uh, and understanding, and especially when you're dealing with human-computer dialogue systems, is really an important part of the task. But in addition, there's also spoken document processing, which is a little bit more challenging, and there are things that you might want to do with spoken documents, uh, such as recordings and, and, and for example, webcasts of, of speakers standing in front of slides talking, like me. Um, in order to do the, the kinds of things you might be interested in are translation, information extraction, summarization, question answering, information retrieval, and so forth. Spontaneous speech is a particularly peculiar variety of speech. It's also the most common variety of, of real speech. And it, it's got a, a couple of other challenges as well. There's some evidence that parsing helps us in dealing with spontaneous speech because it helps us identify edit regions, which we'll talk more about later in the talk. And parsing may be more useful for spontaneous speech, actually, than it is for, say, news broadcasts, because news, bro news broadcasts have a relatively high information rate. If you've ever tried to listen to a foreign language news broadcast, it's much harder than understanding uh, a conversation with somebody who's directing a conversation towards you. So, but in spontaneous speech, there's a much lower sort of apparent information rate and a high rate of pronouns, for example, and parsing might help resolve that. I want to give an overview of the talk before I go on further here. There's three big areas of this talk. I want to talk some about challenge, the challenges that are involved in parsing speech. I want to talk some about what prosody might bring to the issues of syntax and parsing. And then I'm going to talk about four specific experimental areas that, uh, I've, that we did some work on to try to deal with these things. And those are the issues of where you, how do you find sentence edges and how that impacts the parsing phenomena, how self-edits are involved, there's things we can look for within a sentence, and then finally the possibility in an automatic environment that your recognizer isn't perfect, which if anyone who's worked with recognizers knows that it's not just a possibility, it's a, it's a certainty. Recognizers aren't perfect, and so ASR error is the last thing I want to talk about there. An important caveat 
is that this is not a talk that's fundamentally about parsing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time spending t talking about CFGs or the inside-outside algorithm or any of the, uh, uh, the details of the parsers that are involved. I use parsers off the shelf to do this kind of work. So I'm not going to, as mostly we're going to focus on the issues that arise in the speech side of things. A few disclaimers before I get really going. We're standing on the shoulders of a couple of important people here. Uh, the uh, Kelba, Ciprian Kelba, who is not here. Um, is he? No? Then, uh, well, too bad. <laughs> Ciprian's in Microsoft Research, so he must be busy. The, um, he's done some important work on structured language modeling, which was involved here. Uh, the Charniak and Johnson systems, who, they're not only our collaborators, but they're our predecessors on some important work on this, this stuff here. And the, uh, Dan Bacall and Michael Collins have done some important work on an, another parser that we used for this system. I also want to thank Brian Rourke and the uh, Hopkins Summer Workshop team from this year who uh, came up with an important evaluation measure called SparseEval. In addition, I want to make an additional caveat that this is a practical approach. That is, it's not strongly theoretical. I'm not trying to make a statement about the, structure, the true syntactic structures that are here or, 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 or any deep, uh, deep, deep statements about the prosody on the other side either. The goal is to make a fully automated system, and we're trying to use whatever tools we have at hand. So the big issue is that speech and text are not the same. And a lot of parsing work has been, starts with the idea that, that, that it, we're working with text. And unfortunately, spoken documents, well, when you're dealing with written documents, we expect punctuation. And punctuation turns out to be very helpful in parsing written documents. Spoken documents don't have them, so we need some kind of punctuation to deal with this. And it turns out most parsers need it, but then, of course, in automatic speech recognition, we don't really have punctuation. Um, speech recognizers make mistakes, which is an important issue. And speech carries a lot more information than just the words. And we're hoping, so that's two things that are problems. And one thing that we hope is actually an advantage, there's speaker information, there's intent information, there's emotion information, and there may be additional information as well. For conversational speech, we're particularly interested in these, uh, these sort of challenges that make conversational speech particularly hard. Disfluencies, interruptions, incomplete sentences, these are common in spontaneous speech, if they're not the majority. They may even be the majority. Spontaneous speech is also a different register than, than written text. Uh, so there's different wording choices, the way that you'll, and we'll see some examples of that later on in this, uh, in this talk as well. There's also a wide variety of, of levels of articulation in, in spontaneous speech. You'll see casual speech in some situations. You'll also see hyper-articulated speech, which is another form that doesn't look like, like news broadcaster speech. And in either of those uh, extremes, you'll see that humans even have trouble transcribing this if you're trying to transcribe it, you know, even at the level of the word, let alone the level of the phone or the phoneme, depending on your theoretical hang-up. The, there are examples. Uh, this is an example of written text. And I'm not going to try to read it because that, was sort of, that sort of moots the point. But it's an example from the Wall Street Journal. And it's, it's been tr this, these sentences have been parsed. And in the corpus of the Wall Street Journal corpus, these sentences have a uh, parse structure assigned to them that's uh, well, it's the Wall Street Journal pen tree bank, and so it's not, you know, it's nobody's favorite syntactic formalism, but it'll do. Um, these sentences don't look like speech, though. Let's take an example about what, this is a, a transcript of a conversation. This is an accurate transcript of a conversation. This is something somebody went through and wrote down every single word somebody said. In fact, it's a two-sided conversation, and there's a lot of disfluency and, and mixed information in here. And if we cleaned it up, we would look, it would look like this. Now, this rendering, with the speakers separated cleanly and punctuation and capitalization inserted, this information is suddenly a little bit more comprehensible. We hope it's a lot more comprehensible, but at least a little bit more. And this is a conversation. Up there, it's a word sequence. So the goal here is to get from one to the other. And let's zoom in on what we've done to get there. The thing we might want to do is to, I want to draw your attention to three colors here. There's the red double bars, which indicate sentence units or sentence-like units. I say sentence-like units because there's actually a whole theoretical controversy tucked into that sentence-like thing, but we're not going to go there. So the, we assume that, we, that these SU boundaries are, are more or less periods. The plus IP information, that is the green piece, the green plus, indicates this is a point where the speaker found a, a, a mistake and stopped and revised it. So anything that's green, then, is in the mistake, in the edit region, as we call it. And so there are green words that are edits and blue words that are filler words. Filler words that is, have a low content and probably are just indicating to the listener that there is some kind of pausing or hesitation going on. 
speech recognition, however, adds another layer of problem to this system here. Now, this is an ASR output of an old system, um, and it's, it, there's these words that are highlighted here in yellow have their, uh, seem suspiciously strange. And in fact, they are because they're wrong. The, the problem with these in this case is that these, in the first case, in it versus then, we've made a small mistake and it changes the syntactic effect of the sentences. In the later mistakes, they're all three proper names, which raises a particularly difficult problem. If these proper names are not in the speech recognizer's dictionary, we get stuck. And um, in fact, this example started out life with a misspelling even in the reference. So, I mean, in the, in, in the, in the, in the lower one as well. So it's easy to understand how you can make these mistakes. To make an additional note here, this is not about spontaneous speech, but in broadcast news speech, uh, names are particularly a challenge. They're high frequency, and yet they're often novel. They didn't turn up in the dictionary before. So how do humans do it? Well, let's listen to an example and find out. I hope this works, because I had it all set up before. Oh, it's not working. Uh, I'm going to spend just a second and try to get this to, uh, let's see. Okay, so that's that conversation that's conversational speech. Unfortunately it's it's noisy, it's complicated, there are all sorts of other things going on in that speech. Um, and how do we as humans manage to understand what's going on even after a few, a few words? I tuned in in the middle because I was playing with a volume control and I didn't do that on purpose. But even after a few words, you figured out what was going on in that conversation. What do we use to figure that out? As humans, we use speaker change information. When someone's talking, another one says, hold on a minute. That information, the, the, that information is, val is available there. There's wording cues with I mean that indicates edits perhaps or okay, a recovery. Vocalist in the previous example might be a hint that that that, that uh, Salif Keta was in fact a name and not some other you know sale to Decatur or whatever that example was. There's also prosodic information here. That is, there's pause information, timing information, fundamental frequency, which is related to pitch, energy, and the, these these pieces of information also indicate segmentation and how you would chop up this the, these pieces into into chunks, salience, which pieces are important, intent, and emotion. So what is prosody? Let's talk more about the details that are here. Prosody is not really what you say. This is now, not, the linguists in the audience know that I'm glossing over a huge area here, but I'm trying to get this across to, uh, quickly to get a sense of what's important here. The punctuation of spoken language can be indicate the difference between okay, 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 and okay, and those are all different things. And so it can be an example of meaning or intent, and here's, an, here's a great example with single, this is just a monosyllable. Oh. Right. Those are really different, and they mean different things, and that's 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 complicated. We can also use prosody information to help understand what the sentence actually is. Now, this is an example with two different synthesizer, the same synthesizer, that is. So we're not dealing with the quality of the synthesizer, but with two different pitch tracks. One with no pitch information, no 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 prosody information, and the other one synthesized with with the, the true prosody, that is, they took the true prosody from a red version of this and mapped it onto the synthesizer. Let's start with it without prosody. One, two, chief justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court in April, the SJP currently the Edward Kennedy reaches the mandatory retirement age of 70 and his successor is expected to so be named in March. It's pretty painful, right? <laughs> and that's partly because the synthesizer is old and lousy, and, it's, and, and, and but we need a synthesizer that you can control the pitch on directly, and so we, use, we chose, we use this one. Let's compare that to something where the prosody has actually been mapped to the human prosody. Wanted, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, in April, the SJC currently heard Edward Tennessee which is the mandatory retirement age of 70, and his successor is expected to be named in March. So there's still plenty of problems with that synthesis, and that, but there are, they have to do with the segments, and they no longer have to do with the sense of like where are the phrase boundaries and which parts belong to what part and how the thing relates to each, itself and each other. So the prosody is right, and let's look at there's two different ways we can think about prosody. We can think about it as a symbolic system, that is, it's a prosodic phrase structure with word prominence and tonal patterns. So you'll see examples here like wanted, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, 
And each of these, these hooks and curls here is intended to indicate these particular prosodic gestures that help us out there. We could also look at prosody as a, symbol, as, a, as, a, as a continuous representation with parameters here like fundamental frequency, energy, and duration. And here we see the same, pitch, the same thing with a pitch track. From a linguistic point of view, we know that these things are related to syntax. There's perception and production studies that suggest that phrasal attachment decisions are how, that is, how a phrase attaches to another phrase is related to the prosodic structure, and especially in, in the large-scale intonational phrase boundaries. We know that speakers also, there's actually a very interesting study from this year uh, that suggests that speakers actually produce a disambiguating prosodic information even when the context around it Suggest, it makes it entirely clear where this, now, where this particular phrase should attach. Okay, so that information is there even when the, when the human has enough information to resolve it without it. There's other psycholinguistic studies that suggest that prosodic cues guide an initial uh, resolution of ambiguity. And it probably helps to segment words, even, even when we're, especially when we're dealing with spontaneous speech. But prosodic structure is a little flatter, ultimately than the tree bank like structure that we see when we look, when we try to draw out a tree bank structure we have this we have a, a rather high structure uh, a high 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 density tree and I'm going to look at an example here this the purple the upper the upper these are the same sentence and the upper one is laid out in terms of how the tree bank this is the wall street journal sentence we saw one of the wall street journal sentences we saw before this upper one is laid out in terms of the tree bank structure and then you can see that all the brackets and all the indenting there's actually quite a bit of nesting happening here I've even left some of it out. But down here we have the prosodic structure, or in a possible prosodic structure for this sentence, which is much flatter. And this is, uh, this is as, as, as nested as the prosodic structure will probably get. And so those, those two, the prosodic stru structure is not the same as the, as the syntactic structure. Previous work on trying to do parsing with this kind of information has been used to, un to help with ASR systems and to try to help to uh, score the parse and word hypothesis and relate them to each other. And that's interesting, but it only works if you can have a very strong parser that knows exactly what the possibilities could be, for example, in a command and control environment. And it's been used to help speed up or make feasible certain kinds of, of these kinds of parsing. And ultimately, we've been using this prosody in order to provide preferences for one parse over another, but mostly, in, again, in isolated utterances and that ignores an a critical detail, which is how do you find the edges of these utterances? In a command and control environment, the edges are pretty clear. You stop talking, that's the edge of the utterance. Some other recent, some recent results on trying to deal with these bigger problems comes from Michelle Gregory, who uh, uh, last year tried to work out a way to use prosody features as if they were words and was unable to make progress with that. So some people might be skeptical about doing this, and I think it depends on your point of view whether these skeptic, even these skeptic moments make sense to you. But we'll start with them one at a time. It may be that you say, prosody isn't the only cue we've got, so why do we need to put this into our parsers? You know? And that's a good question. But the truth is that there's so many unreliable automatic pieces in trying to deal with speech that it helps to have multiple knowledge sources, and prosody could be the second one, or a third one, or a fourth one. Another possibility is that you, you know statistical parsers pretty well, and you say, hey, look, we can already prune on probabilities. Do we really need prosody to make this parsing feasible? I mean, those feasible reasons that we showed before, that, that stuff's all, all so no longer necessary. Well, what we'd hope is that this prosody would provide additional information, and so it would make some of this, these probabilities better, and so that would get us better decisions. And furthermore, parse probabilities may not be reliable, especially when the words are wrong. And if speech recognition, especially on spontaneous speech, it usually is wrong. So there are four challenges here. Now I'm on the last section of my talk. Just so you, this is going back up to the top level here. We're going to talk about the four experimental directions that we've looked at here. There's SU segmentation, handling self-edits, intrasentence prosodic events, augmenting punctuation, and speech recognition errors. These are using metadata boundary events, and this one here is using ASR alternatives. And I hope we'll have time to go through all of them. The experiment, I'm going to whip through this, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. We're using a section of switchboard uh, that has a parse tree attached to it. And the parsers we're using on these things are tra the Charniak parser and the Bikel parser, which are two of the state-of-the-art statistical parsers right now. There's an ASR system, which is the, a the SRI uh, five times real-time system. The state-of-the-art there is 20 times, so this is not, uh, not ideal, but there are reasons to be using this one instead. It's also a lot faster. Um, and we're using two different evaluation measures parse eval evaluation measure and the sparse eval evaluation measure which allows you to get the words to have the words be different 
depending on the different experiments. In the alternative segmentation strategies side of things, we might be interested in looking at pause-based segmentation, which is actually how ASR systems do it. They stop. Um, every, 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 every time there's a long enough pause, they just cut it off, and then they say, we're going to recognize the words in this sequence. We might also be look, interested in trying to detect automatically where are the ends of the sentences. Unfortunately, pauses are not perfect, and if we take a hand-labeled sentence boundary, we find out that they don't correspond to either of these systems, unfortunately. The automatic system would be great if it corresponded exactly to the Oracle system, which will be called this third bullet here. The Oracle system is when it's been hand-labeled. And the automatic system that the best one we've got is uh, using both prosodic and, that is, acoustic prosody, that is, pitch and timing information, and lexical cues in a decision tree. And we're using sequential information to try to help to constrain that to a, to a, a reasonable sequence. So just to, there's some error numbers in here. The automatic system does a lot better than the pause-based system. That is the, what we're calling the auto system here that uses all this other information. But it's still sub substantially below a 1, which would be the best you can get on the F measure. And the slot error rate uh, is uh, substantially lower, but there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of work to be done to, get the, to make these systems perfect. The impact here on parsing, though, is really phenomenal. If you use automatic segmentation, you get 20% reduction in error, okay, compared to using the bad sort of pause-based segmentation. Pause-based segmentation is a pretty good stab. It's the first thing anybody would think of if you're starting with, how do we want to find the edges of sentences in speech? You look for long pauses. But that's not the only place. There are long pauses of sentence internally, and there are also long pauses or areas or sentences that don't have a long pause on either end. So this is, in this scenario, we're looking at the error values for the pause-based system, the automatic system, and the oracle rate system. And this is on speech, and so it's, it, these numbers are not great. Um, but there's two, a couple of caveats here. We're using no explicit edit detection, and that's actually one of the reasons that I think the Charniac system does less well. So the overall, what we're finding is that segmentation makes a big difference. And this isn't really shocking. If you don't know where the sentence boundaries are, it's very hard to parse. But it's, an important, it's important to see this actually in, in real data. And what we find is that pause-based segmentation can triple the bracket crossing and double the error, which is really terrible. And we get huge, huge gains from using basic automatic detection. And we, that information also uses uh, inf simple information like, what word is it? The lexical cues. That, word, that helps a lot to help find the sentence boundaries. But that's not always the way that a signal processing person would come at this problem. And so it's important to know you've got to get the words right, too. So lots of room for improvement there. And we have other experiments that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Uh, I have a slide for it, but I'm not going to show it to you unless you ask. <laughs> it's uh, about punctu using punctuation that's different information than what, SU, than what this, these other boundaries can provide. The second thing we might be interested in is looking at these self-edit regions. These green regions in here are edit regions, and we like to take them out, ultimately, because they don't contribute very much. Most of the time, they contribute nothing to the content of the sentence. Repeat and rephrase edits are modeled pretty well by a rough copy. That is, it's, in this example, we see the, the, that's a repeat. And there are other situations where you say, the man, I mean the woman. So those kinds of, of scenarios are rough copies of each other. Unfor and that's great. And they happen fairly often. We were, I was. Unlike restarts, which happen somewhat more rarely. And Charniak and Johnson claimed a couple of years ago that PCFGs, that is a context-free grammar, does a lousy job at modeling this rough copy. And there's some math that suggests that that's the case. But we actually hadn't seen that before. And so, and they, so they, but they proposed that a, a separate edit detection step should help improve parsing. And let's look at that. So we can do a couple of different things to try to do edit detection. We could try to include edits in the grammar like any other constituent. We can add or not add those plus interruption points. And we can use a separate edit, or we could use a separate edit model and then parse the cleaned up text alone. And that could also have, that separate edit model could or, or could not use those IP inf information as well. And we can try to do them at the same time or we can do them separately. And we tried, in, this, in this, these experiments, we try to use only the Oracle SUs. That is only the system where we know where the main sentence boundaries are. And we're trying to look at stuff inside the sentence. And so we only looked at some of these options. There's a lot of choices we could explore here. And um, it turns out what we, what we discovered from these numbers here, PCFGE means it's trained with edits in place. And PCFG plus tag means it's that the PCFG, the, the parser itself, is trained on, uh, is trained on edit free text with, a, with a, some modification systems allowed on top of it. So the PCFG alone, as it turns out, is a really lousy edit detector. 
That's not surprising. That's what Charniak and Johnson claimed in 2001. But it turns out that here's an interesting result. If you look at the last row, the edit, edit performance is much higher if you know where the interruption points are. Again, not a shock, but it turns out that that's really, that means that, the, that knowing where the, the IP points are could help a lot. There's some results from a recent evaluation which suggests that if you have automatic interruption points, you can do a little bit better than the other system, but you still can't get as good as the Oracle ones. And we know that the, using the automatic, uh, the, detecting the interruption points automatically helps quite, a, uh, can, can help by a little bit. But let's look at the parsing, in, 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 uh, the parsing score instead of the edit score for a moment. Because if we look at without removing the edits first, we see that we get uh, F scores in the, se in, the, in the high 70s. But if we take the edits out first, we get F scores in the 80s. Okay? That's this, the big picture here. The real key is that regardless of which, edit or which parse model you use and which edit detection model you use, there is a major improvement in doing the edit detection before you go on into the, into the parse detection. So the edit findings, in short, are PCFGs by themselves without acoustic cues are lousy edit detectors. That's not, that's not surprising, and that's something that Charniak and Johnson claimed in 2001. But we've shown it now with some, with some concrete data. However, they can help with edit detection, especially if we have good information about acoustic and copy uh, relationships. And so there's lots of room for improvement. Unfortunately, at IP detection, this interruption, this discovering where the interruption points actually are, is fairly hard. And um, it turns out, this is through another set of experiments that's not showing here, is that standard punctuation transcription strategies like commas and semicolons and periods, for that matter, are not the same piece of information. You can have both pieces of information and you'll still get an improvement. Third major area here is looking at intrasentence prosody. The issues we want to be thinking about here are that there's a couple of different possibilities here. One thing we could be looking at is, are we interested in using the directly acoustic uh, system with the continuous variables, or are we interested in using them in order to try to model some kind of symbolic event? And then, are we interested in using these prosody ideas as word tokens, or are we interested in using them as uh, features of the words themselves, which is a little bit different. And are we interested in augmenting the grammar of a, of a PCFG or one of these, char these parsers, or are we interested in rescoring the alternatives that are coming out of a grammar? The grammar can give you many alternatives. And what we've chosen to do is the, the, uh, the latter in all three of these uh, conditions. We're using symbolic phrase events, which we'll talk about in a minute. We're, we're using prosody as features, and we're using parse rescoring because other way we don't have to crawl around inside the detail inside the Charniak parser. As a symbolic prosody representation, we break it down into three classes. There's a hesitation that is the edge of every word. We can just say it's either a hesitation, or it's a full scale full scale end of sentence kind of break, a fluent intonational phrase, or it's a default. You know, we're going on to the next word, and so we can get the posteriors. We set a classifier to do this. And our motivation for doing this is that acoustic cues are all related to each other in these complicated ways. And it also depends on which speaker it is, the pitch values start in different places, and so forth. The symbolic events map it fairly neatly, relatively neatly anyway, onto syntax in some of the same kinds of sharing, that, uh, information sharing that phone recognitions or phone systems can do to help, to help uh, learn uh, word, uh, word recognition. And the reason this is controversial at all is that it turns out that this requires labeling. And hand labeling for this data is, is tedious and expensive, um, even if you're, even though linguists come sometimes, uh, grad students especially, can come relatively cheaply. The, uh, it still it takes a lot of grad student time, and so we don't want to do that. Or at least we don't want to do much, doing much. Our solution was to label some of the data and use weekly supervised training to extend that information across the rest of the corpus. The, what we want to do in order to, in order to introduce this into parsing, though, is we, we want to generate a wide candidate, group of parsed candidates and then extract, look for characteristics of the candidates that look like good candidates. So for each parse, we're going to compute some. The thing we do first is we generate candidates with a PCFG probability. But PCFGs have a sort of tree local probability measure. And for each of these parses, we're interested in finding non tree local probability measures that might help us figure out which of these are better than each other because PCFGs make assumptions that are not, that don't hold. So for each of these, and the first bullet here represents the kinds of features, some of the kinds of features that are in an existing syntax-based system from Charniak and Johnson from last year, and uh, based on sort of the Collins idea from, from this year, or from, from five years before, sorry. Uh, Collins has done another paper about that just this year. Um, and the, what we've added to this is 1,300 prosodically weighted syntax features, that is, 
features that involve both the, the weights of the, the likelihood of a particular kind of break and the structures of the, of the, of the pieces around there. And I'm not going to go through the math here because I'm running short on time. Um, and I, don't, uh, I, I think that what's interesting is that this is, this is relating the prosody to structures within the tree, but without using tree, tree local behaviors. And we use a maximum entropy re, a model to re-rank those pieces. So our, what we find in these results is that with far fewer prosody features, we get res, uh, improvement in our scores that's almost as much as the, all, these, all these syntax features. And there are two sets of features together. They improve even, even more which improves both the top parts and the whole cohort. And here's the, these are the scores from the top parts. When we're using the best edit model that we have, we can get up from an 84.8, which is using it without re-ranking, all these additional non-PCFG features, up to 86.0. And though that's 1.2, 1.2 is a big deal in this domain. So uh, that's, that, I'll just leave that uh, at that point. If we know exactly what edits that we get, we get 1.1 improvement. And in between, we see that the prosody improvements are substantial and the syntax improvements are slightly larger than the prosody improvements if we don't use the, the syntax. But when we use them together, we get an additional 0.3 over here and over here. So using these, these improvements are partially additive, and that's very exciting. All of these numbers are significant. If anybody's curious about the details of significance, uh, let's talk about that later. The um, last piece is ASR errors. And um, our approach here is to look at M, or sorry, I always get these mixed up. We look at N ASR hypotheses, we look at a number of possibilities from the ASR system, and we parse each of those with an M best parser. Okay, so we end up with an M by N table of parses over different words. And for each of these word sequences, we're going to have now a parse and a word sequence, or many parses and a word sequence, and we want to re-rank using those features, and we also want to use features that look like, you know, is that parse the same kinds of features we used in the previous one, except we're not using the prosody right now. And we're using the average perceptron to re-rank because it's faster than the maximum entropy system. In evaluation, we're assuming that we know the SU boundaries, which obviously from the earlier t parts of the talk, you know that that part is, is not, is, is really important that we get the SU boundaries right. But we know that that, that score would swamp everything else. And we're using sparse eval, which is a measure that counts dependency matches. Because uh, if we're trying to use the span matches, then we have trouble when the words are different. So the other, the, this measure uses a, a de word dependency triple ma uh, match. And unlike the prior work, our goal here is to try to do improved parsing, not necessarily improve, uh, improve word error rate. So it's not necessarily trying to get the words right, although we have some interesting results on that. So when we take our system and we just get the first ASR hypothesis, the first sequence of words, and we run, we run it through the parser and we just take the best parse according to the PCFG, we get an F score by sparse eval, which is a different measure than the other one, of 49.6. Now, that's not very good. but if we look at the best one in the whole, in the whole n by m, the best one we could possibly do is 66.5. So there's a fair amount of range in here as far as what the performance we, can, we, could, we could get out of this n by m set. But when we do a re-ranking, we get 53.2 on, on the f-score. So we're getting four points there in this measure, and that's a, a, a significant improvement as well. What's interesting to compare it with is the word error rate, when we're trying to improve on the sparse eval measure, which is a parse quality measure, the word error rate actually goes down just when we're optimizing to try to get the F score right in the parse. Now that's not surprising because in some respects this parse measure is trying to get the, the words right. But what's really surprising is this last number is that when you pick the one that gets the best F score, we get a worse word error rate. So that means that the word error rate may not be the right optimization if we're trying to get sparse eval as our target. And that's an, inter that's an interesting question. We, this is a, a chart of M by N. And over here we ask what's the best one we could do if we were only to take the top five Here's our M, the top five parses for each of those candidates, or the top five parses of the top five word sequences. And, these, and you can see that there's a room for improvement all the way up. But there's a stronger room for improvement along the N axis. That is, the word, getting the words right is more important. So ASRN has a much bigger impact. This is the Oracle score. This is the score when we re-ranked it. So the, not so the, the, the knee is, close, is farther out over here, but we're still getting a, a big improvement uh, uh, a bigger improvement when we look at larger lists of word candidates than we are when we look at larger lists of parse candidates. But both are still important. Key ideas here, increasing the number of possible word sequences is really important for parsing speech. It's more important than looking at alternative parses even. Second idea, adding parse features helps. Looking at parse features to try to help us 
to try to, to, to try to help us looking at just parse features and ASR scores. We tried using both the parse score and the ASR score together, but that's not, we can get a tiny improvement, but, but we need more than that. We need, also need non-local uh, parse features. And our performance is way below Oracle, but the parse features could be improved and there's feature engineering that could be done there. And then here's this other point that I've already mentioned, which is that Oracle's parse eval scores are actually having a higher word error rate. And this suggests some alternative directions we might go with that. Okay, to wrap up, the speech here poses uh, some challenges because there's information that's not there when you're looking at it from the point of view of text. But there are like punctuation or capitalization or, or even word spacing and, and sentence segmentation, stuff that seems obvious when you think about it from the point of view of, oh, here's a sentence, let me, let me figure out what the tree is. But it's not. And so what, can we, what do we need to add? Well, there are opportunities here, we hope, from these other kinds of information like prosody. And there are four main areas here where we've learned something. There's the segmentation areas where we know that segmentation matters. And that's nice to have some direct evidence to confirm this. We know that self-edits matter, that identifying where they happen really matters, and that interruption, identifying where interruption points are happening can help. And in addition, we know that prosody beyond the interruption points can help some more. That is, we know that there's structural information, and we've shown a way here to introduce that information to make a difference. And finally, in the ASR experiments, we're suggesting that at least if, we, if, for this, is a, if this is a reasonable evaluation measure, this sparse eval evaluation measure, which I think it is, then our word choices are more, are more important than being able to look, at, look down the list a little bit and parse hypotheses. Looking down, not that that's a bad thing, but it's, it's just as important to make sure we get the words right when we're dealing with speech as it is to, or to look at alternative words as it is to look at alternatives elsewhere. Um, that's the end of my talk. This is, I'm just going to leave it up here while we ask questions. Um, this is the only place I promised somebody where I might talk about myself in the third person. The, um, the, my master's thesis is a lot of this work, and there's an HLC paper that just came out on this subject. I also want to mention that Bill is uh, over here, uh, is working on trying to work on word error rate issues related to the same questions. And, um, uh, and there's uh, people at Brown who've done a lot to help us out with this work. And then the summer workshop at Hopkins uh, with a long list of names here that was working on parsing and it, how it relates to SU detection, the uh, sentence boundary detection. And they have an interesting final presentation and also introduced sparse eval, which uh, I can talk about more if you want. That's all. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, it is. Was he doing work before on trying to parse lattices directly out of the speech recognition system? Um, I don't know if Matt's been working on parsing lattices. I mean, parsing lattices is obviously a, a direction you could go with, with this environment. We use nBest list because the nBest environment for rescoring the parse trees was already there. And so we're just using nBest list and then feeding. It makes the nBest list, you know, it adds a dimension to the nBest list in a way. Right, uh, but it seems like you, you, you got a lot more benefit out of parsing a longer nBest list from speech than you did out of looking at more parses. Mm -hmm. So it seems like. I do think that's an interesting way. Uh, I think that uh, the, I can tell you why I didn't do it, and it's because it's the Charniac parser we were using, and that's the current state of the art. But it's it's also Eugene's, uh, and I, I'm kind of scared of the internals. <laughs> um, but the, but I think it's I think it is a good way to look at it. I mean, it's clear that getting the, the looking at word alternatives is really important. Yep. Any other questions? I've cowed everyone. <laughs>